Well, welcome everyone to the United Lodge of Theosophists here at San Diego. And um, we are putting on these weekly series of Zoom meetings, which are hybrid. We have some of us here in the lodge and the rest of us are um, participating via Zoom. And these meetings are based on the genius of the Aquarian Almanac. And there are these intriguing and very timely topics that are presented on for our consideration and contemplation and even meditation uh, every week. And this week we will be hearing about the city. I suppose it's a symbol, it's a metaphor, it's a reality, it's a dynamic. And, we, and I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Maurice Bischoff who will speak on the, uh, the concept of the city. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And thank you all for coming on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I'm gonna be covering kind of a panoply of thoughts and ideas on the city, both kind of metaphysically, somewhat, somewhat historically, um, at least for the first part, of the, my talk, and then I'll briefly consider what the conditions might be for an emerging city of man, which is uh, relevant to the quote that was read off by Jonathan that's in the almanac. I'd like to give my gratitude to so many wonderful sources and an amazing article called The City by Helen Balborg, which can be obtained as as a symbol article found on the Theosophy Trust website. And in addition, of course, to uh, Sri Raghavan Iyer, who wrote Parapolitics Toward the City of Man. Uh, and then subsequently many, he had many theosophical references to the City of Man in his later theosophical talks and essays. And they're just really wonderful. And I'll be quoting somewhat extensively <laughs> from some of them today. Um, basically, as I wound up after composing this, I kind of saw a Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva principle operating as we went through this, but it's not particularly linear. But I think the spirit of much of the study of the city might be this is an excerpt from the Aquarian Elixir. Every successive phase of manifest existence, whether of individual monads or of the entire human race, is new and unprecedented in a Heraclitan sense. Yet every unfolding moment epitomizes the vast sum total of the past, replete with rich potential of the future and evanescently bubbles upon the infinite ocean of eternity. And so the idea of the city seems to float in that infinite ocean of eternity in different ways. Now, when we arrive at the idea of the city, we begin to see a landscape change in our mind. The human settlement patterns begin to change. We see a shift in terrain and see emerging in front of us a man-made landscape. Quoting from the symbol article, The City, quote, the city embraces principles of space, elevation, and height. In being man-made, it has the power to concentrate the hopes and dreams of individuals in much sharper focus. Great mountains and canyons can subdue the ego, but the city promises deliverance from the bonds of ignorance, which are etched across the featureless planes of living. Wow. <laughs> um, so there's something about the intelligence that could be found in something called a center or a city rather than just in the uh, boundless uh, countryside where there is also intelligence, of course. 
Now the city has a long usage metaphysically and it has a sacred lineage. In the hymn to Dakshinamurti, the first stanza reads, the cosmos is like a city reflected in a mirror, seen as if inside, but really outside it. As in a dream, it is an internal activity appearing outside, but actually inside. The truth is the supreme Brahman, one without a second. Atman is its reflection, seen through the media of the senses, the mind and the intellect. The identity of the supreme Brahman and one's Atman is realized through self-illumination. He by whose grace that illumination comes to me, to that Dakshinamurti, the supreme being embodied as the auspicious and benign guru, I offer my profoundest salutation. It is through reverence for and the grace and the great elixir of sacrifice of the guru for their student. The same, similar maybe to the sacrifice of a mother for her child, that projections of the buddhic ray of rare and rarefied intelligence combine with a deep feeling to draw light and create a unifying whole, a dynamic circumference, and can be seen as a manifestation of the one and the many. As we heard last week, Fohat in its various manifestations is the medium or link between consciousness and the impress on matter or form. Thus, with the projected way of buddhic intelligence, we come to develop a center within the manifest world, within the terrestrial world, and these centers draw others. And such that we use the word cities as almost a figure of speech, cities of galaxies, cities of man, and so on, reflecting fructifying spiritual lines of force in and beyond space and time. Okay, now I'm gonna share our screen. I can't, oh, here we go, share screen. And so we have a wonderful passage from the symbol article, The City, and it reads, the heavenly city was the symbol of a sacred doctrine, which might divulge the secrets of the truth and beauty and way of the good. Jerusalem and Athens or an Urdu, the off-resurrected holy city, which for millennia symbolized the womb or reflection of the heavenly matrix in which the male spirit fecundates the germ of the visible universe. Such cities are sacred sanctuaries of antique wisdom, even whilst they engender and shelter generations of fresh ideas capable of leaving their stamp on the human psyche for centuries. They echo the grandeur of Asteria, the sunlit birthplace of Apollo, and the fabled seven cities of Cibola, where in the seven primitive groups of the first root race, were gestated. Reflecting the principle from above below, sacred cities can be sensed or inferred, if, if not formed, through being obeisant to the cycles of the cosmos and to nature. Quote, cities were built where prophecies were made or mysteries occurred. The town of Eleusis grew where the Eleusian mysteries were held. And even today in Faktipur Sikri in India, built by Akbar, was the spot where a holy man foretold the birth of the sun. 
all of the buildings and great walls around this amazing edifice suggest an elaborate yet ethereal sense of balance and proportion. Again, drawing extensively on the symbol article, Masons who built these holy cities were originally connected with occult mysteries, whose foundations, foundational doctrines were equivalent to the foundation of a city. They laid down initiation into mysteries. Thus, the founding was a religious act. The ancients never formed a city by degrees, but founded it all at once as a sanctuary for common worship, usually from an oracle or an auspicious sign. When the sacred fire was lit, the hearth of the city was established and a temple raised around it. And subtle communication with the gods were an aspiration of worship. The secret doctrine teaches that at the end of the third, third race, the last two sub-races built cities under the guidance of divine instructors. These builders or Dian Chohans were the heads of seven dynasties of divine kings who taught the architecture of the mysteries and appeared in history first as gods, creators, and then as divine kings and rulers. They reigned in cities like Iodia, which was the capital of the Ishvaku kings and was said to be full of wealth, fragrant flowers, palatial buildings, and mango groves. The religion of this city was centered upon the principle of devotion to duty. As the early Masons knew, the plans of cities were never arbitrary or utilitarian, but in strict accordance with sacred doctrines. These could also be seen as divine proportions, which can be recognized in city gatherings from great indigenous cultures. Man and the cosmos were and considered independent, interdependent. There was no radical separation between the cycles of the earth in relation to the invisible sky and the heavens, the earth, man, and nature. In a student's presentation at the Institute of World Culture on Urban Architecture, it was mentioned that the earliest known urban environment on American soil, that found in the vicinity of Chaco Canyon in what is now Northwestern New Mexico, the stone structures here were built by the ancient Pueblo peoples, formerly called Anastasi, ancient ones, who were thought to be ancestors of nomadic tribes that roamed the canyon over 10,000 years ago. They built aqueducts, storage facilities, kivas, and an extensive road system. There appears to have been a deeply embedded mythological ethos linked to fundamental geometric forms and to cyclic astronomical events. Geometries such as the golden rectangle, the Pythagorean triple, equilateral triangles, and 45 degree right triangles have been identified by researchers at the nearby Sun Temple, temple of Mesa Verde. These appear to have been integrated with viewing points and alignments suggesting the winter and summer solstices, the cycles of the moon and of Venus, the rise of the Pleiades and of Vega on the horizon may have been of particular importance to the ancient Pueblo peoples. And we find this of course throughout Mesoamerica. Indeed, the classical and Renaissance conception of the city was sort of a microcosm of the macrocosm and in addition to the built environment, there was social and political organization, which was done with trying to point to a higher unity and a larger good with the idea of human dignity. In this Renaissance ideal, one would have a morally and functionally interdependent community honoring ratio and proportion with symmetry and ordering. The Renaissance ideal itself harkened back to the writings of Plato. In the laws, Plato taught that the long before the construction of the first cities, 
Saturn, Kronos, had established on Earth a certain form of government under which man was very happy. This was so because Saturn knew that man could not rule over man without injustice. Under his wisdom, the flocks were given a shepherd of a superior nature who taught mankind and bequeathed the genius of invention, which led to the domestication of grain and animals and the building of the first cities. Now, authority grew up in cities when it was ruled by the worship of sacred fire, partly from the archetypal worship of the original founders of fire, the Agnishwata Petris. Now, when tribes united, however painfully, they adopted a common religion, and their first loyalty was to their god and city-state. The sacred symbol of fire thus became a unifier, even as the city now is more of a concrete reflection of a modern civilization, a complex artificial environment that insulates man and nature. We can take even the empirical city of state of Athens, which empirically was one thing, but nonetheless provided not only the ideal of democracy, and it was an ideal, but all sorts of images and aspirations about communities of participation, which allowed for the aspirations of harmonious living. Thucydides wrote, fix your eyes on the greatness of Athens as you have it before you day by day. Fall in love with her. And with you, remember it was won by men with courage, with knowledge of their duty, and with a sense of honor in action. In Plato's ideal city-state, honor was an aspect of formulating justice. Uh, which itself was both an ideal and an aim. Just a man should possess and concern himself with what properly belongs to him. Thus, this legal conception pertaining to justice is connected with his moral significance. Thus, justice involves the right relations of elements in society. But they're not static. They are based on a cosmos as an expression of a divine dynamic harmony, which includes lesser disharmonies, which can be beneficial in allowing for learning and pointing to a greater harmony. At one level, at a very basic level, this can be seen in the principle of division of labor according to natural aptitudes and a coordination where physical needs are satisfied. Uh, so each person needed others to satisfy even their basic needs, let alone their social and spiritual needs, for necessity demanded specialization. However, there's always a tendency to go beyond bare necessities, where the healthy state will not be big enough now. It must be swollen up with a whole multitude of callings, not ministering to necessity, but to a great love of material goods. So even in his time, Plato was concerned with the city-state swelling with luxury, which eventually becomes the root of injustice. Thus, we needed someone to make policies and rules to create a conventional society to circumscribe and combat unfair advantage. Thus, we can turn over authority to train a specialized role. The guardians, specialists, fitted both to be in combination a fierce warrior to protect the state's enemies and gentle to its own citizens. Spirit would be seen to predominate in the nature and but need to be, had to be controlled by the rational or philosophical element, 
which seems to predominate in the nature of the higher sections of guardians, a philosopher king, a love of wisdom and understanding. Thus going beyond just a psychological view, a philosophical view is based on the rational basis of ends consistent with means based on universal principles from which more selective models and criteria can evaluate provisional actions on essentially what alternative might be the most essentially good, whatever the outcome. Rational means need rational ends. Yet this only makes sense when we acknowledge our preferences and desires we already have. And if need be, purify our desires, adjust our thinking, and in the company of fellow men, through earnest philosophical reasoning for the common good. Thus, the training of the guardians for to perceive the true good and beautiful when they are very young is necessary. And that involves the unfolding and awakening of amnesis or soul wisdom to cultivate search for truth and goodness. Education then in the city becomes most important for the very young. First from the use of stories and myths and festivals to uplift the mind and the soul to great gods and exemplars of men, and to later mathematics and the more abstract arts, especially philosophy. In a sense, they are, some are chosen to be servants of the city of man. Plato emphasized the cultivation of virtue and intuition. The later Romans emphasized the outward arts of government and universal law giving. So you've all probably heard of Roman law, which still exists in Europe and other places. Uh, and cities themselves became associated with citizenship, civitas, and civility. Yet for Plato, the virtues of the state were the sole qualities of the citizen. And as such, played a special part in society, depending on where one was qualified by the predominance in his nature of the philosophic, the pugnacious, or the commercial spirit. But all three elements exist in every individual who is thus a replica of society in miniature. And one might say society is a projection of the collectivity of individuals. In the perfect man, reason will rule with the spirit elements uh, dominant over the bodily appetites. But that means self-control or temperance will be a condition for internal harmony, all the parts of the soul being content with their legitimate satisfactions. Justice finally appears in this ideal state, no longer as a matter of external behavior toward others, but as an internal order of the soul from which right behavior will necessarily follow. Injustice, on the other hand, is of internal discord. Thus for Plato, the dialectic of interior growth cannot be separated from the civic activity of the social self. The creative performance of duty for the polis is essential as the well-being for it and as a way to self-knowledge. There are ways to cultivate inner virtue. And in fact, for Plato, virtue is true knowledge. This seems to be similar in many respect to the way we say that we can use our own self-devised effort to take principles, universal principles, sacred principles, and make theosophy a living power in our life. But we have to do this by practicing the paramitas virtues. Thus, the ideal of the city of man, man qua man, always has the principle of self-transcendence. It is always imminent and intrinsic. In our interior life, the immortal soul is descended through different levels of form and matter to experience and learn, allowing others to also uplift 
their particular range of consciousness. This love of wisdom, love of discriminative learning, stems from the soul's divine discontent to eventually ascend in consciousness to a divine consciousness. H.P. Blavatsky writes that theosophy considers humanity as an emanation from divinity on its return path thereto. Outwardly, this might mean affirming the possibility of the good, the agathon, without claiming to know what it is and to take responsibility for oneself in the light of that initial affirmation. Thus, consciousness must be purged of its persisting illusions and its proliferating delusions. We first, of course, must admit that our conditioned existence make for limited viewpoints and temporary attachments, uh, which eventually do not hold up in reality and cause suffering to ourselves and others. For Plato, an antidote meant the conscious cultivation of the virtues, sophrosyne, courage, justice, and noetic wisdom. Since the virtues are not merely modes of action, but rather refined elements of individual character, inherited and activated powers of the human soul, their disciplined use is a potent purifier which releases spiritual knowledge latent in the soul and evokes when one is operating as what we would call through the higher self, amnesis or soul memory. This means raise, continually raising questions, including self-questioning, in light of the universal principles derived from the agathon or good, which cannot be circumscribed. It also means dianoia, thinking things through. Growth can be realized, especially through inner meditation and self-study and correction which over time trains the mind to have a sufficient detachment or critical distance. Thus, the more we individuate, the more we can elevate the circumference of our intuition, thinking, and refined action. We can also use our laser-like ability through buddhic intuition and intelligence to sift through the more true from the less true, the greater good from the lesser good, even in limited circumstances. And, be, and thus those most interest, individuated are also drawn to learning through the company of other people and wish to look for their viewpoints in the polis of which we are all interdependent for we all need each other even though underneath, we all come from the same universal unity. Those most individuated then are drawn to the moral claims of our communities based on conscience and a reasoned search for truth. Then in a spirit and eros of sacrifice to the Supreme Spirit or to Krishna or to the Agathon or spiritual son um, as a precondition, we can take B.P. Wadia's definition of sacrifice, the self-energized, willful, thoughtful offering, which wisdom makes for the growth of the weak and the ignorant, joyously, because with a purpose, it is sacrifice or yajna. Thus, it is sacrifice in the line of duty for others, for the sake of others, intelligently, and the self-study and error correction that goes with it, that each and all can sustain the city, the Vishnu principle, which could pervade all. Now the quote from A30 says, the person of understanding will look at the city within him or herself and take heed that no disorder occurs in it such as might arise from either superfluidity or from want. Plato, poverty 
Plato points out, consists not in the decrease of our possessions, but in the unending proliferation of our wants. Thus, there is this need for an elusive sophrosyne, a soundness of mind in balance, proportion, and reason. And thus, in a way, he points to the ever-present and unmanifest, unmanifest aspirations to ascent, to really something that becomes the city of the soul. Um, this is expressed much differently in a poetic and mystical terms by Rumi. So we'll share our screen again. Now I want to toggle. So. Well, yeah, we did that. Now we have to move it from one one place to another. The uh, arrow screen on the um, on your keyboard. Yeah, it's not moving. But, um, um, some, the space bar may also advance you in the okay. backspace. Here I am. Neither one wants to do that. Um, um, why don't we stop the, sharing? And the see. Page up and page down may also do it. Okay. Just start over. Yeah, I'm just starting over, but I'll try that. Why don't you hit escape? I mean, okay, try your toggle thing, and if that, that doesn't work, I got an idea. I'll yes. do. There we go. Yeah. There we go. You said the map. Okay, and so Rumi will give us a different kind of idea about the city of the soul. Holy men dance and wheel on the spiritual battlefield. They dance in their own blood. When they are freed from the dominion of self, they clap a hand. When they transcend their own imperfection, they make a dance. From within them, musicians strike the tambourine. At their ecstasy, the sea bursts into foam. You see nothing, but for them, leaves on branches are clapping hands. You see not the clapping of the leaves. One must have spiritual ears, not the ear of the body. Close the head's ears to jesting and falsehood. Then you may see the resplendent city of the soul. We don't want to do that, but what we do want to do is escape. Okay. Well, that gives us a sense that there is always the city of the soul. Uh, it's just that it's a potential and it's unmanifest, but it is there at least as one uh, develops, as was said, spiritual ears and sort of sloughs off the terrestrial attachments we have in the body. Um, however, we do have a process of inner conflict sometimes, knots in the heart. 
And we sometimes must work with that. And we have to see each individual person as a soul with human potential and a voice to be heard through and beyond the suffering of the persona, such that we can meet people where they are and get into a helpful dialogue when the time is ripe, such that we learn ultimately to recognize one's similarities with other human beings that in fact, we're not that much different in the city. And as one and many people have said, one way to begin is to stop finding fault with others. So sophrosyne is consistent with coming closer to one's fellow men and women. These joint principles of transcendence and brotherhood are necessary to hold on to a continuity of consciousness. Um, and that's why regular meditation and self-study is always uh, very useful, as well as studying in the company of others with, around universal principles and their application. The modern city, however, is kind of the opposite. Instead of a continuity of consciousness, it basically seems to be more of a fragmentation of consciousness. Um, it seems to be the shrine of personality and external comforts and luxuries. It seems to be irrational as well as it is unjust. It is a powerful magnet for the enthrallment of the senses and is focused on more from the outside, the allurements of different forms and different attractions. We, call, we might call that the eye doctrine without deeper ideals to create meaning, aspiration, and brotherhood in the cave of our heart on one hand, and few principles and reasoned criteria requiring voluntary self-restraint on the other. It is no wonder that modern cities portray man's disorientation and fragmentation of consciousness, resulting in separateness, loneliness, alienation, and injustice. However, I hate bad-mouthing the city because I grew up in one and I kind of love it. Uh, below the surface, we can salute the islands of fraternity and even universal brotherhood that we find. And we can salute the many unsung heroes exemplifying individual initiative, social and ecological entrepreneurship, and spiritual nonprofit and public service activities who express loving kindness and keep all of our communities stitched together. In fact, with models now of ecological interdependence, we may very well find new relationships between urban and rural life, possibly even an agropolitan kind of model for a new kind of city. Or we might find that cities are growing things vertically rather than looking for just horizontal life. And modern cities dimly reflect that feminine principle. They still welcome the stateless victims of injustice or climate crisis. They may still provide hope, a second chance for bare sustenance or meaning or viable self-definition. But what if one takes the idea of a dwelling and then sees a city as a place where there's a diversity of inhabitants, but attracted to some kind of unifying idea, unifying culture, some kind of manifesting potential from the unmanifest? What, for example, if we choose to draw on to create a city of man? What might, with gratitude toward the Supreme Spirit, or great spiritual teachers, we can develop a provisional ideal of the city of man? Now, Pythagoras presents a classic oath in this regard that we can begin to take each day. In the first place, revere the immortal gods as they are established 
and ordinated by the law. Reverence the oath. In the next place, revere the heroes who are full of goodness and light. Honor likewise the terrestrial diamonds by rendering the worship lawfully due them. So what would be entailed in the city of man? In Parapolitics, Sri Raghavan Iyer writes, first, it is an ideal conception. Any polis or moral community is an imperfect embodiment of Sivitas Humana. Second, there is a nascent set of global community emerging in our own time. And thirdly, and this is most important, with the disillusion of moral traditions in man and societies today, basic political concepts and deeper inner spiritual values and ideas need to be renovated within a matrix of political and self-reform, which allows one to transcend oneself. The ubiquity of human suffering across the globe has allowed people to expand their idea of a global community. The Dalai Lama has spoken about a universal secular ethics based on the idea that we are all part of the human family, the global family. And with this recognition comes a universal responsibility. The emphasis on the universal good allows us to see ourselves as part of the whole, not the whole, and carrying inside us the same difficulties and afflictions that others express, thus giving us a natural humility and empathy. Furthermore, the city can become a point in a horizontal network of aspirations and activities we might call a cosmopolis. On the physical plane, microelectronics creating a global village. For example, Marshall McLuhan and Bruce Powers wrote in 1989, the satellite turns the user into discarnate information. Once placed in relation to the computer and transponder, the user is everywhere at once. One can appear simultaneously at every terminal access point on Earth or in outer space. The nature of the satellite surround is that it has no center. Centers exist everywhere. They point out this is the way the Europeans understood the character of reality and culture in pre-Renaissance times. No major national borders, simply centers of thought and influence. Cities were haunts of beings, being, ideas, and lineages of sacred traditions, such as still exist in India and elsewhere, attract people. Thus, the city itself may become an attraction for those that self-elect and self-devise their efforts to create the conditions for a city of man on earth. This creates a whole different perspective, almost like working in the timeless, in time for the ever eternal. And one step at a time for lifetime. There's no easy and quick uh, way to move here. But it does mean moving beyond selfishness as a primary motive and being able to embrace ideals and lifelong learning for its own sake, for the common good. And again, this can be seen as a never ending quest for reflecting on universal principles, but also generating helpful models and then policies without imposing an ideal of the city of man or anything else on others. With the universal spirit, one can become a compassionator of continents in Walt Whitman's terms. One can walk freely, be gracious and kind, and become attracted to wholesome thoughts. Everyone can become one's teacher. Thus, as one of our quotes say for this week, only an environment where everybody knows what is going on and where there is a lively awareness of the greater world can the human potential for collective self-realization be actualized. In such a city, man may nurture the idea of the common good. In the Aquarian age then, we are being asked to rise to the higher self 
and begin a lifestyle which elevates manas, our thinking principle, thought, will, and feeling, to a point where we raise our circumference, recognize our ancestors, and the gift of ever-expanding potential in the use of manasic wisdom in ourselves in the service of others. We can see others as well as ourselves as immortal souls on a vast pilgrimage of learning and unlearning. As Bhavani Shankar points out, even in the early stages of life, an aspirant for the higher life becomes a participator of the grand silent work of spiritual enlightenment of his race. The current of the living moral and spiritual energy flowing from his heart being his humble contribution. This can open up our heart to practice the golden rule. We can also then align ourselves with larger cycles because as our lead quote for the week says, we can recognize the sacred design nurtured in the united mind of the builders and once again lay down a plan for the city of man. So let's see if we can share a screen. And let's see if I can. There we go. Uh, Jenny, would you like to read that? The restoration of individual dignity and human solidarity is a primary object of the Aquarian age and a necessary prelude to participation in the succeeding age of Makara, of magical creativity. The development of self-conscious humanity on earth began well over 18 million years ago. Following a much longer period of development during the first three and a half realms on the earth's chain, throughout this vast period, Successive ethereal hierarchies fashioned the sentient but non-intelligent vestures of future mankind. With each succeeding round and globe, a different class of builders evolved out of itself more and more dense, shadowy projections. All right. During the early portion of the present fourth round, the sixth group or hierarchy, counting downward from spirit, evolved out of itself the flimmy astral vestures of the future physical man. The seventh or lowest hierarchy then gradually formed and condensed the physical body of animal man upon the ethereal fracted with vast numbers of terrestrial spirits or elementals was capable of completing self-conscious intelligent man. Thus it became the task of the fifth hierarchy, the mysterious beings that preside over the constellation Makara to inform the empty and ethereal animal form, creating out of it the rational man. This in itself is an awesome mystery, which may be understood only through meditation and ultimately initiation. The role of theosophists then become pioneers, and though far in the future, in the full manifestation, those in the sixth and seventh who are touched by the current of the sixth sub race with the help of teachers using the seventh principle, the Atman, will be able to germinate living seeds of creative thought. There is a joy and a thrill in activating manas, the power of abstract ideation, with the help of seminal spiritual ideas and laying down fertile seeds of self-regenerating 
modes of thought, and patterns of living. Those who make this heroic effort become pioneers who point to the civilization of the future. They gestate new modes in the realm of pure ideation and bring them down to the region of the visible, laying foundations for a more joyous age in which there will be less defensiveness, fear, and strain in the fit between theory and practice. The great opportunity that the Aquarian age offers is to gain a sense of proportion in relation to oneself, entering into an invisible brotherhood of comrades who are making similar attempts. Their mutual bonds come alive through their most inmost reverence for their teachers who exemplify in an ideal mode what their disciples strive to make real in their lives through sincere emulation to the best of their knowledge. And these are excerpts uh, written by Raghavan Iyer in essays that you can find in uh, the three volumes of the Gupta Vidya. So in summary then, what could a fully realized city of man be like? Each person can become a center of light, of illumination, of the buddhic ray of the higher refined intelligence, which can draw in others into a nucleus of universal brotherhood for study, learning, and service. As a friend of humanity, one can fuse, fuse love and knowledge, the head and the heart, dwelling on associated ideas which can be manifested for the realization of the city of man. Now that you've had to listen to me for so long, we will close with one model of the city of man. One ideal is written about by B.P. Wadia in his article on philosophical anarchism. He writes, the free man is one who has realized the power of his Atman to a certain extent. This realization has made him find and adopt the law of his being, which law finds expression in his own life. He lives in the company of other free men who similarly through Atmic realization have found and adopted their individual laws of being and of life. Imagine a community of men and women who have realized the power of Atman, whose individualities, therefore, have attained freedom of thought and movement, who are detached, each a monarch unto himself, and yet live in harmony because each has lost the power to impose his will on others or to wound them. The common tie between all is the self-effort of each to live his life in terms of the laws of his own being, a life of inner richness and reality, which receives only one kind of aid from without, the self-effort of each to see the viewpoint of others. I added the city are all playgrounds for the unfoldment of the individual. All are instruments whose aid our free man will eventually be able to come to birth. So, thank you. And I'll turn it over to Jonathan for questions and comments. Oh, thank you, Maurice. What a well-developed, well-thought-through, um, beautiful presentation. Um, you've really thought this through from so many points of view, and it's so inspired. Um, it seems like you were talking about brotherhood in action, I guess. Um, I, I have I have a question. Um, maybe you want to. Um, there you go. Um, oh, looks like uh, Judy. Go ahead, Judy. Uh, go ahead and ask your question first, Jonathan. And I'll okay, ask. Okay. Well, um, I was working on the question, Maurice, just thinking it through while you're talking, and as you kind of proceeded, a, a lot of my question I, I think was answered, but. Um, this, this idea 
and you can probably cite the quote better than I can, but was the idea that um, as we work on our inner development, um, somehow that the working on one's inner development and participating in the life of a city are not antithetical, but they're dialectically somehow the same thing, that they're two sides of the same thing working towards each other, perhaps. Yes. And um, you're working on um, sensitivities, you're working on a feeling, a brotherhood of unity and diversity, um, on a refinement of consciousness. Uh, so that might be the development um, of, of, of within. And you mentioned the paramitas. And then working in a context of a city where there's all these systems in place in cities. Um, and there's all these opportunities for civic uh, volunteer work, um, leadership, uh, committees, and so forth. Um, anyway, I was just wondering what that, if you could develop a little bit more, what that would look like of, of the inner development and the outer service in the context of a city might might look like and how these two sides would kind of dialectically uh, nourish each other, I guess. Well, I'll take a stab at it and then maybe others have some ideas. Um, uh, the first point and what I learned from doing this is that, you know, we think of a city as all these systems and things and for the most part it is, but what really makes a city is the initial founding. Mm. principles, the initial founding light, that uh, the initial uh, founding inte spiritual intelligence, which draws people in. Well, so it could be a simple temple town. It doesn't, what I learned, because I'm into size and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't have to be size. Even though we usually think of the city as size relative to, let's say, a farm or a small town. Um, and as to your question, I think um, what makes it, I think, kind of dialectical is that um, one needs to be able to continually ask questions about what's good for the whole. And one has to do that both in terms of some phase of meditation, it doesn't have to be the whole thing, but one has to go inward and sort of light the fire of arrows light that fire that you want to search for truth. You want to be able to think through some of these things. And when one sees suffering on the outside, disorder, if you will, uh, that causes suffering, then that fire of service and sacrifice, that link, that fohat, that link, if you will, that inner fohat that links the two, uh, creates the ability to go out in the world and participate in the polis. In the and if one can't do it as one big thing, then as was kind of hinted at, one can find their own sources of wholesomeness, fraternity, service. But the critical aspect is doing something on behalf of the Supreme Spirit, on behalf of something universal, on behalf of mankind. So that we, I know we have the Rotary Club and the Lions Club and all that kind of stuff, and they do good things and all. Um, so we want to continue to expand the circumference of how we think about things and how we can contribute. And certainly contributing in terms of inspiration and ideas, especially universal ideas. and seeing their application uh, in these systems you're talking about, I think would be, and then going back and through meditation and self-study, self-correcting, because there's error and all, no, that this dialectic then can begin to raise us, assuming we're doing this under the light of buddhi, because it's under the light of buddhi, buddhic intelligence or a mental posture, that gives the elixir of ascent. Thank you, Judy. Yes, uh, Maurice, thank you for such a profound exposition of the uh, highly idealistic 
idea of the city. And I'm wondering if you could comment further in this context on Plato's laws. I don't know if you read it recently, but I was recently thinking about it. And I mean, in a sense, when you read Plato or some people do superficially, they think, why the old fool? I mean, he uh, imagines a city in which uh, laws can't be changed, of course, because he's really talking about divine laws in which there is a, an education in which people really learn what justice is, you know, that it's not helping friends or harming enemies or the interests of the stronger, and they learn really what beauty is or what truth is or what subject of all the dialogues. And so there isn't uh, crime, mental illness, and all the things that cause us to need to have a lot of human laws that are very imperfect. So the paradox about that dialogue is that there really aren't any laws compared to what we have now, or the need for police and such. But people just act according to laws. But this seems like an ideal that's almost unreachable. I mean, it's Plato was a fifth rounder, and he's talking on that level. And so he's he's also in some of the dialogues is critical of poetry and art because I think it's what uh, was the media of the day, you know, reading boys the Iliad and telling them they have to go out and kill for Greece and that kind of thing. So I I don't think he's really against uh, real art or or real poetry or such, but he's just against the use of media which we have and in such a corrupt way. So I wonder if this ideal is reachable or if it can only be practiced in a, in a way that's um, personal with each of us uh, to develop ourselves at this particular juncture in time. Yes. Um, I think uh, kind of the answer would be Yes and no. Uh, I do think that it's very important to have an ideal and to begin to strive toward it because that starts to create an ascent, that starts to create questioning, that starts to lit a fire in people. And one can find, even if they're islands of fraternity or islands of universal brotherhood, uh, you can begin to attract other souls. And I think HPB, if I'm not wrong, suggests that even by attracting other souls, not just souls that are here now, but as we have much more of a critical mass, so to speak, I hate to use that word, but all these different nuclei of universal brotherhood, as thoughts and ideas become more purified, they're going to draw down new births that will be more attentive and more inspired and more identified with this. So we are really working in the present as we always do in theosophy, not simply for the present, but also for the future. Yes. Any other questions or comments? We got a question here in the lodge. Hello there, Maurice. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Hey, I was Ken. wondering if you could go over again for a moment on the um, the uh, the cosmopolitan city. You were talking about a couple of different layers. Uh, the physical was one of them, and then wasn't quite sure what the other aspects are. Uh, one fascinating thing in the sustainable. Uh, physical city is uh, vertical uh, agriculture. Uh, yeah. there, there's a, a futurist from Florida who talked about that in some movies called um, um, Zeitgeist. But anyway, what 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 are the other aspects of this this polis you were talking? This cosmopolitan polis. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, the one thing is, I didn't think I'd have enough time to talk about the fact that there's tremendous amount of nature in cities. In fact, uh, one writer 
whose book just came out, Urban Jungle, says that there's more species in New York City, natural species, than there is in Yosemite. Uh, and there's no a question that there's a lot of potential in the interstices of cities to create green, not just green belts, but all kinds of uh, models of more symbiotic relationships between people and the natural world. And of course, we've heard about community gardens and we've heard about, more importantly in my mind, community supported agriculture. So the whole idea of the city itself unfolds differently and cooperates with the rural aspect. After all, there's moral interdependence there. There's, there's where our healthy food supply comes from. And we know that we have 30% waste uh, right now of healthy foods. Um, as for the cos cosmopolis, obviously it has uh, uh, different levels, but it usually has a sense of a global community. And I think, think globally, act locally, which you phrase you may have heard 20 years ago or whenever, still might apply, although you could also reverse it and act locally and think globally. Um, but I do think thinking about humanity and acting on behalf of humanity, um, we can start to develop centers at various levels, uh, centers of linked communes, centers of linked scientific organizations that are trying to develop healthy villages or smaller aspects of cities. I didn't get a chance to talk to the fact that cities have, you know, who's in your sugar borrowing community? Who do you borrow sugar from? Uh, your elementary school community uh, or your mom and pop store, your beauty parlor or something, uh, let alone to really smaller districts of scale where are they are communities of place and that community of place should be honored and in fact is sacred for many people. So if those can begin to link up horizontally and begin to support each other and then come together when needed, if there is global crisis, um, that would be one larger aspect of the idea of uh, a cosmopolis where we see ourselves as a member and not as a dominant member, but a, a member of this larger community. Um, and we have an interest in different cultures. We have an interest in what other people have to say. So it's a very active kind of cosmopolis. Just as a little anecdotal story, um, in the very late 70s, uh, there was an organization in LA, I think it's still there, called the Tree People, oh, Andy Lipkus, right? Andy Lipkus. Um, and he was really responsible for planting millions of trees, really, in the LA and also in the, uh, in the mountains near LA. And um, one time he hosted uh, Bill Mollison, who was one of the founders of permaculture. And so Bill Mollison shows up and he's answering questions and so forth. And he was, um, one person asked him, well, what about all these skyscrapers? Um, it, it, like when, when the real um, crisis comes, because that was kind of the, the thinking that it's all gonna fall apart, right? The whole system's just gonna fall apart at some point. And there's people that think that now, but anyway, um, he, he says, what do you mean? What about skyscrapers? And the person was saying, these are these big permanent things. What are we going to do with them? He says, are you kidding? They're just, they're unused greenhouses. They're great. We just got to wait till these offices get out of there. And <laughs> interestingly enough, with, all, with Zoom, a lot of these skyscrapers are empty now. Or not empty, but they're getting empty. And there's a whole financial crisis around that. But perhaps in a kind of a uh, yield and overcome sort of way, that maybe these skyscrapers can be used, as Bill Mollison says, for greenhouse uh, activities. Um, I just wanted to add one up. more thing oh, about Andy, Andy Lipkin. He went on from tree planting okay. to create in Los Angeles 
uh, wastewater retrieval in the whole oh. city of Los Angeles. I mean, mm -hmm. think how big the and recycling of water. And he was the main advocate. So it just shows what one individual conspired yes. people to do. Thank you for that. Miluka? Oh, hi. Good afternoon. Um, oh, good evening almost. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, I remember reading in the uh, Theosophy volume under Cities Under Cities in 19, volume in, in, was written in 19, 1912. And it talks about that HPV used to love to talk about this type of conversation about cities that remain and how the cities are built over, over other city and mm -hmm. the influences of, of the, the elementals to make people kind of build it in the same spot where another one was. I was wondering if you have some comments about that. Um, that's very good. I don't think I'm acquainted with that article. So first, thank you. And I do think that everything is a cycle. And, uh, and I think the cities, like everything else, they have the birth and they have their maintenance and then they have sort of their death or their decline. Um, but it is true that eventually through the spiritual lines of force, especially that were laid down at a higher level beyond the terrestrial, that that continues to influence, it seems, as you point out, elementals. And it might also, because we have past lives too, we may be attracted to some of the places that we were as well. So you make a very good point about how elementals can be drawn from cities that are, as you said, under cities. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, oh, um, I just wanted to mention um, kind of uh, in kind of closing the meeting, um, first of all, Maurice, thank you very, very much for presenting such a comprehensive, um, beautiful presentation. And I think we all got um, quite an education about a city. And it's really wonderful because so much of us live in large cities and we see a lot of bleakness and graffiti and concrete, et cetera. But to be able to have you kind of breathe into um, our imaginations, um, this ideal idea of, of a city. And it's interesting that um, Judge, in some of Judge's articles, he points out the importance of lodges. And it could be that he's out of date and this and that and the other, and he was writing 140 years ago. I don't think so. I think he was talking about an occult reality, that the importance of lodges in a city is, um, it cannot be overestimated. Um, and he, he talks about how a lodge is a living thing. And also, Maurice, you mentioned something about how we can all become centers of universal brotherhood. And, uh, and so, and if that's true, so can lodges. And uh, lodges are like force multipliers of people all together, uh, doing that together. And Judge makes a point that a lodge makes a difference in the town and then in the city. And that lodges are an incredible uh, function. And it occurs to me that um, just as the lighting up of Manos is something that supposedly happened 18 million years ago, just so when people catch fire with theosophy, that that's kind of an ongoing lighting up of Manos even now. So it's creating something, um, a continuity and a flow out of something that theoretically happened in the past, but it's something that really becomes rekindled in the present. Just so um, that how you were mentioning that it matters how cities were founded and how they were started. And many of them were started where, some, uh, where a sacred event or a sacred occasion or a sacred uh, initiation took place, right? like uh, Eleusis, for example. Mm. And that with the idea of the living power of people working together and studying together in a lodge or in this um, kind of Aquarian Sangha that we have with the internet, that's kind of rekindling 
in many cities that original founding, it would seem. I don't know if I got that communicated right, but. No, um, very good point, yeah, wonderful. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you all very much for coming. And next week, uh, it's Noetic Psychology, right, Ken? All right, so, all right, stay tuned, Noetic Psychology. So, Maurice, thank you very, very much. And thank you all for coming. Thank you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank thanks you. for <laughs> wonderful presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Sure. That was awesome, you. Marie. Thank you. It was truly, it was moving. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Have you all week. for coming on Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> thank you all.